Hi everyone, welcome back to Show the World Your Garden. We're at Kualoa Ranch on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. And it's best known for shooting locations like for movies like Jurassic Park, Jumanji. It's a popular tourist destination with ATV tours and all kinds of fun things. But they also grow and harvest over 60 different varieties of tropical fruits, vegetables, five different types of proteins, which makes them the most diverse farming operation in the state of Hawaii. Today, we're taking you on an exclusive behind the scenes tour of Kualoa Grown, the agricultural arm for the ranch. They produce high quality, responsibly raised food. And the cool part is, 100% of the food they harvest here is consumed locally, which helps support a healthy food system on the island. We're in for a day of adventure, incredible scenery. You are going to love this. The first person you need to meet is Taylor Kellerman. He's the land manager here at the ranch. Hi, Taylor. Aloha. Pleasure Aloha. To meet you. Thanks for having us here. Yes, of course. Well, tell us what is so special about the ranch and what your role is here. Oh my gosh. So the ranch is a very unique place. We're, we're 4,000 acres strong. We are encompassing three verdant valleys. Um, probably one of the most beautiful areas you'll find in the world. Definitely one of the most beautiful areas in Hawaii. Um, and we are a working cattle ranch, a working farm, a working aquaculture site. Uh, but we utilize kind of a multi-pronged approach where we invite guests and visitors to come and see what we do and it helps fund all of the great stuff we do here. Wow, that's amazing. And you can't go wrong to work in such a, a place with such an amazing backdrop here. Oh my gosh, it's something, it's a dream come true. I'm, I'm from originally from about seven miles down the road. So the ability to manage and care for and what we call Malama, an area like this, it's basically a dream job. There's not many of those around. So I feel very fortunate. Now tell me the inspiration and motivation behind the ranch and how did Kualoa Grown start? Sure, so the ranch itself has a, a fairly long history. So it's family owned and has been since 1850. So as you can tell, it's a very old company. However, what's been great is the family has always considered themselves stewards of the land. And so therefore they found it important to maintain all of the open space, natural environment, and quite frankly, you know, environmental beauty that you see behind you. And so for us, that is basically our business model, is it's all about keeping Kualoa Ranch, Kualoa Ranch, and allowing people to enjoy the natural beauty that's here. Um, Kualoa Grown is actually stemmed out of um, a situation where we've always had agriculture, we've always had ranching, we've always had pieces and bits, but when um, COVID hit, actually, we were able to turn to a community feeding effort that then allowed us to create that cohesive brand that is now Kualoa Grown, where we produce over 60 products and we sell, uh, I'd say 95% of it direct to consumer through our on-site market. So it's been a really nice way to kind of wrap neatly all the different food producing that we do here because it's so diverse. So really you've been able to incorporate what you were naturally doing at the ranch already, but then you know, pivot a little bit and provide a really great resource for the community at the same time. Yeah, we, you know, we exist in a, in a beautiful area, but the reality is, is one could consider it a food desert of sorts. You know, the local grocery stores are either half an hour north or half an hour south. And we really feel like we've been able to find a good niche market here Wonderful. in the ranch. So really the Kualoa Grown market is where all of your uh, pr produce and proteins are sold and are, is a resource for the company. Yeah, there. yeah. you know, it, it was fantastic because again, <clears throat> you know, we kind of found opportunity out of, out of chaos and, and during the COVID yeah. area, we did a drive-through program oh, great. where for nine weeks, over 180 families were able to get custom boxes of things that we did. And that just built and built and built. And then we started a brick and mortar about two years ago. And now we not only offer all of our products, but over 30 partner farms as well. So we've kind of created a platform where the whole east side and island community can have a place where they can sell their products as well. Speaking of the Kualoa market, what are some of the crops, fruits, vegetables, proteins? It sounds like there's a ton there for people. Yeah, Tell me about that. You're gonna learn about a lot of them today, which I'm really excited yeah. about. Uh, we are really well known for our grass-fed beef. You know, we do grass-fed, grass-finished. Uh, we're um, one of the only places on island where you can consistently um, purchase that. That's a local Oahu product. We also do local pork, we do uh, oysters, we do Pacific white shrimp, about 20 different kinds of vegetables and about 20 different kinds of tropical fruits. Uh, one of the things we've been really working on lately too is our value add. Uh, we produce almost 30,000 bars of chocolate now. Cacao is a big crop of ours. 
but we also take um, novel local ingredients like breadfruit, which we call ulu, and we make chips out of them. Um, making them a little bit more accessible to our visitors, those who want to try something different but may not be as adventurous um, with that raw <laughs> ingredient. So, but it's a lot of fun. People really do enjoy it. Wow, I'm getting hungry just thinking about all that delicious food. It sounds amazing. Yeah. And I bet you do get a lot of visitors um, from out of state too as well, from the mainland. We do, we do. And it's, it's great because what we do is we take our visitors and we, uh, you know, we utilize kind of a sell-in, sell-through concept. Mm -hmm. And I like to explain that to people because everybody knows us for Jumanji and Jurassic World and right. that type of thing. And that's our sell-in. That's what gets them here okay. on site. But what's been spectacular is that every tour we have has an agricultural or a conservation component. And that's our sell through. So even though you may not be knowing that we're going to kind of force feed you a <laughs> bunch of really cool information around mm -hmm. land management and agriculture and ranching, we find that a lot of our guests actually, that's their biggest takeaway. And so it allows us to not only teach people about ag, but it also allows us to kind of have a platform about what Hawaii, why it's special, what being a good visitor is all about, and really just kind of how to perpetuate all the things that make this such a beautiful, special place. Tell me about some of the challenges here, and I'm sure you have them. Sure, you know, I think the biggest challenge, quite frankly, is we are in the tropics. So when you think about the fact that we don't have a winter and we don't have kind of a break in the cycular, excuse me, cycle for things like weeds and insects, yes. it tends to be a never ending battle. Uh, we also are quite prone to large weather events. Um, we do have large floods. We do have situations where you have an unexpected weather event. But I think, quite frankly, the biggest challenge we've been having is um, being able to do everything that we do and finding the staff that is um, willing to come and learn and, and really kind of execute on that food model. Because I think there's a lot of folks out there who appreciate local food and who really want to learn more. But, you know, creating that workforce pipeline with younger kids mm. has been where we've been putting a lot of our energy lately. And how about balancing land stewardship with food production? How does that work for you? You know, it's interesting. That's a question I get asked a lot mm -hmm. because if you think about it, with my, my role, I uh, do participate in certain industry groups. And so mm -hmm. you've got to imagine I participate in uh, ranching groups like Hawaii Cattlemen's Council. Mm -hmm. And then I also participate in conservation groups like uh, Kotla Mountains Watershed Project. And so when you think of it from that perspective, I'm taking what a lot of people might consider an, an antagonistic, um, or at least historically antagonistic situation. But what we're able to do is really kind of act as a, a medium or a nexus, a point where we can explain how you can utilize responsible food production as part of your conservation model. And you know, it's something that it, it is a challenge and it is something that doesn't necessarily um, have a cookbook of how to do it mm -hmm. but when your primary goal is stewarding the land in the best way that you possibly can you basically are your own neighbor and what I mean by that is anything we do at the tops of the mountains affects anything we do in our farmland affects everything we do say in our aquaculture environments and so being that all islands are on a slope it's 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 actually kind of almost a concept that you have to ingrain in everyone mm -hmm. that being responsible at your point is going to help the entire ecosystem. So if you look at it from kind of a grandiose perspective, it's actually quite easy. But the devil's in the details, as they say. <laughs> I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like you're doing an amazing job of it. Oh, thank you. Okay, so are you ready to see all that is Kulo Ranch and Kulo Grown? We are ready for an adventure today. Well, I'm super excited because we have a full day lined up for you. You're going to see almost everything that we're able to do here, and I think you guys are going to have a lot of fun. I cannot wait. So let's go show the world Kulo Ranch and Kulo Grown. Tell us what we're going to be doing here today. Uh, today we're going to be cleaning some of our oyster baskets um, and rolling them. So. Awesome. They don't stick together. Our oyster operation is only on this half of the pond. Yeah, we've got about 60,000 oysters. 60,000, wow. Do you supply oysters to like local restaurants, to at, sell it at the market stand? Um, we did at one point, but we sell them up at the, at the uh, Kualoa market. Okay, tell us a little bit about how, they're, how the oysters are grown here, that, that whole process. We receive seed which is basically just baby oysters about usually around six or seven millimeters. Um, okay. And we'll take them and we'll put them in baskets and we have a, a series of baskets of different mesh sizes. So 
they don't fall out. But we basically just keep them out here and clean them and watch them as they grow. And then as they get bigger, we'll move them up to larger size mesh. Basically keep doing that until harvest. So. Okay. And how long does that take usually to harvest them? About six or seven months, but it depends on the variety of oyster. One of the varieties we have now, the Kumamoto, it takes, it takes longer to grow. But the oysters here in our pond and in Hawaii usually because the water's warmer, they actually grow almost twice as fast. So these were the baskets that you were talking about where yep. the oysters live and grow? Usually with like the flip bag method, the tide will rotate your oysters and keep them clean. Because we have to shake the baskets like that. Okay. And part of the reason too is it breaks the lip on the shell. Um, and it promotes the oysters to grow in more of a cup shape. So you're simulating the tie by doing what you just did, shaking the basket. Yeah. Do what with them? Um, we have to bring them in and then we'll, we'll pressure wash them. And right now we've been, all our baskets when we bring them in, we'll soak them for 24 hours in okay. fresh water. Um, and we have like four freshwater springs on the edge of the pond. So okay. it mixes in here. And ideally for the oysters, we actually want a lower salinity around like 20 PPT. Well, you can't beat the backdrop that you get to work in every single day. I mean, this is incredible. Do you ever just look up and go, what am I doing here? This is amazing, just right, about, Josh? Just about every day. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful place to work. It's incredible. What's your favorite part of what you do here? Favorite part is the mornings, watching the sun rise. It's so beautiful. Oh, yeah. Josh, I've never driven a boat before. <laughs> just keep your eyes on the water and you don't bang nothing. <laughs> These are heavy. Well, we're just taking out some oysters from this basket. We usually just sort them out, take out dead oysters, or size them up too. Okay. Just give you guys a look at what we have to offer here. Oh yeah, I'd love <laughs> to see it. Quite the delicacy, huh? Bad, no deads in them. Nice. How do you tell when they're dead? They're going to be open. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. When will they be ready to harvest? These ones may be in like another two to three months. Okay. And about what size are they when you harvest them? When we harvest them, it should be like, like maybe three and a half, four inches maybe. Okay. So a lot bigger maybe. than that one. Yeah. Thanks for showing us around, guys. It was yeah. a lot of fun. Anytime. A lot. We are here at the aquaculture operation at the ranch, and this is Jenny Lee. She oversees Hello. this whole area. So tell us a little bit about what you do here at the aquaculture center. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, here at Hakipu'u, we try to raise farm fresh shrimp in a sustainable manner. Uh, right here in front of us, this is our nursery tank, our first grow out phase when we receive host larva shrimp. Ah. Uh, we receive our shrimp from Oceanic Institute out in Waimanalo. They come in very, very small and we grow them out to a gram uh, in these tanks. It takes about three to four weeks to do that process. Once we grow them out to one gram, we will transfer them to our grow-up ponds. So you got the little teeny tiny babies in here. Teeny, would you like to see them? I would love to see them. This is so cool. How fun. So these little babies have been growing in our tank for about three oh, weeks now. Oh, look at them hopping around. Can yep. I pick sure one up? Sure can. Oh my gosh, so this look at is these guys. our marine shrimp. The scientific name is Little Panes Vaname. Uh, in the industry, because of Vaname, they always call them Vanna White because they're the white <laughs> shrimp. <laughs> so, Cute. Yeah. And then, how long do they take to grow here in the pond before you? In move the up? pond, it takes about three months to get to harvest size. Our harvest, harvest size is about 18 grams. Uh, for those who always purchase shrimp, it's always number per pound, count per pound. Mm -hmm. So that at 18 grams is about 24 shrimp per pound. Okay. Yeah. And then you supply them to the local community, local to restaurants? Local community, restaurants. We have several restaurants account, one of which is FET, who just won the James Beard Award recently. Yes, and, I've heard of them. Um, also just mainly through our cool little grown market. Okay. And community can come in, affordable prices for the community. It's great. I was born and raised on this side. Uh -huh. I know, so not too far. 
from here. So this is our pond grow out area. Currently we have nine ponds in oh, production. Wow. All nine ponds are dedicated to our shrimp. Um, normal stocking density for these ponds is about 50,000 shrimp. Oh, wow. Pond. The color you see in the pond, it's actually not brown water, that's actually algae. Ah. It's uh, living organisms, phytoplankton. The shrimp don't consume it, they just do better in the presence of it. Okay. And if you can see on our aerator here, the birds, it helps keep predation down. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, so before we start throwing the net, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to bring the shrimp in, sort of ring the dinner bell. <laughs> so in order to do that, we use our uh, highly complicated scoop, <laughs> half a bottle. Love it. To uh, scoop out the feed and then just throw it in the pond. And here they'll come, huh? So we try to keep the feed close to the dock where we're going to be throwing. Okay. So it takes about five minutes for them to start coming in from wherever they're at at the pond. And then in the meantime, I can show you how to throw the net. Oh yeah, that'd be cool. So this is your throw net. Okay. How a throw net works, it's a pretty genius setup, is this is your eye of your net. And as long as this eye is straight, your net is going to be open. What I like to do is just slide my hand down. Mm -hmm. This is a traditional Hawaiian way of throwing the net. Oh, cool. I learned this from my grandpa when I was five. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. I love it. <laughs> throwing the, the whole, whole thing. thing. Okay, okay. And then the trick is to drop your shoulder a little bit so that the net has an easy way to go over. Okay, here we go. Ready? Step. Did it! How'd I do? Hey, that's great. Now you can just pull your string up, pull the string. I think you definitely caught something. Ooh. Keep pulling it, keep pulling it. You caught stuff. Yay. Then you can just hold on to it. Walk. Oh my yeah. gosh, I caught shrimp. Look at this. And add it to the loot. Yeah. Now you're just gonna pull that up and release all the shrimp. Oops. Yep. I don't want to forget that guy in there. Get every last one of them out. How many do you think are in here, Jenny Lee? Maybe about, this looks about three pounds. Nice. 70 shrimp or so. These are big. What is the most <laughs> rewarding part of your job? Uh, I would have to say this part, harvesting it and feeding the community. Yeah. I've been in the industry for about 18 years now and help people provide shrimp for their communities, but now I get to do it for mine. So what a satisfying yeah, feeling. This is the best part. <laughs> Love it. Kualo is actually one of the last remaining shrimp farms that produces shrimp for food. So okay. really farm to table. The real deal here. Real deal. Jenny Lee, it's evident that you love what you do and you love the land here, love the community. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Uh, thank you for coming and yeah, check out our shrimp and Malama Aina and support local. We are here at Moli E Gardens with Dan, who runs this whole side of the operations. So tell us a little bit about what you do here with the tropical fruit. Yeah, so I've been working with the ranch for more than 10 years and in this space for about uh, two and a half years. Um, I'm in charge of all the tropical fruit uh, trees here. Um, primarily we're growing a lot of cacao as with a lot of exotic fruits. Um, we are in charge of maintaining the trees, pruning, fertilizing, harvesting, post-processing. Um, this is a unique area. It's a shared space. We balance the agriculture with uh, tours and event space. So it's an interesting uh, mix and kind of speaks to the unique business model that Kualo Ranch has. Okay, let's go check out our rambutan trees. They are just starting to set fruit. Oh, cool. And so we'll be able to see just the young green fruit setting on the trees. I'm not familiar with that variety of fruit. So rambutan is very similar to lychee. Uh, it has an external um, uh, kind of rind. You open that up and there's a white flesh on the inside. It's similar to a grape, but a little bit sweeter. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, the cool thing about these trees is we've had these in here for years and they didn't fruit for a long time. We've uh, started bringing in bees and having pollinators that are close to these trees have allowed these trees to flourish and set fruit on a regular basis. Wow, that's awesome. Um, so we typically, we have uh, seven trees and last year we got over 850 pounds of rambutan. Green puffballs turn red when they're ripe 
And so we always kind of joke that the Christmas ornaments get on the tree and just because they come around right at the holiday time. Just in time. Yep. So yeah, it's again just pointing out just the fact that how important pollinators are to having uh, successful um, orchards where you don't need to add chemicals or anything to induce um, fruit set, but just by having you know the abundance of pollinators in the area really helps the trees thrive. What are some of the challenges you face here, Dan, in growing in your tropical orchard? Um, so it, this is our coffee field. So uh, coffee has been a very popular crop uh, in the state for a long time. Um, but when we uh, grow crops like that for long periods of time, we expose ourselves to the risk of invasive species. Oh yes. Um, so we have a lot of pests that come in, um, the coffee borer beetle, and there's a fungus called coffee leaf rust. Um, that presents a challenge for growing coffee. Um, so we have to uh, stump the trees every couple years because the population of those pests gets so high that it creates a situation where the coffee is not good to roast anymore. Oh, okay, I see. Um, so in getting uh, stumping the trees, we remove the home for the pest oh. and then we restart and then we're able to have a couple good crops before that pest pressure comes up again. Okay, well I know our viewers can definitely relate to that in our backyard gardens. We have all kinds of issues with pests. So it's cool to see how you take care of them and we can all learn from that too. I think I smell chocolate. What's going on here? Yeah, so welcome to our cacao orchards. We're just coming into our fall harvest season. Oh. Um, so you can see our trees are loaded up with pods. Um, you can see the pods grow out of the branches and the trunks of the trees. Okay, and yeah. um, we have just started our first round of harvesting for fermentation. Um, so what we do with our cacao trees here at Kualoa Ranch, we have about uh, 12 to 1500 cacao trees. Um, we harvest them once we get to a certain uh, volume of, of pods. Uh, we take the wet beans and um, we put them in buckets, let the juices drain out of that for about a half a day. And then those wet beans get put into uh, uncured oak uh, ferment boxes. So we do the whole ferment process and then we dry the beans after about a week of that. And then those dried beans, we send those to Manoa Chocolate, which is located in Kailua, a locally owned company. Mm -hmm. They white label our bars as Kula milk chocolate, dark chocolate, and we have a rise and shine, which has coffee added into it. And that's all uh, seeds or beans from our farm, single source, um, not blended with anything else. Um, so we have we're currently creating about 25,000 bars annually and looking to grow. Wow, that's that. so exciting. So when they bust open this pod, it doesn't taste anything like chocolate. It's that whole process that you have to go through yeah. and you get this beautiful bar at the very end of it. Yeah. Wow, we're going to definitely stop at the market and pick some up on our way out. Awesome. We are here at the Ka'ava Valley Ag Center portion of the ranch and this is Austin. He manages this area. And Austin, tell us a little bit about what you do here. Yeah, so um, I'm Austin, as she mentioned, uh, and I manage the Kava Ag Center. Here we kind of focus on raising small livestock, so anything smaller than a cow. So we have pigs, we have sheep, we have chicken, we have rabbits, we have turkeys. Um, we also grow diversified ag, so papayas, bananas, uh, dragon fruit, raised beds. Um, all different types of stuff. Wow, I like the raised bed thing there. Yeah, yeah. Way to go. Well, it sounds like you have quite a diverse operations. But I noticed over here you've got some pigs, but I don't smell them. Yes. So I'm going to be interested. Why don't we go to take a look yeah, and you sure. can tell us more about it. For sure. Kind of a cool thing to take note is um, a lot of like conventional piggeries, pigs will kind of escape the pressure of humans because that you know they see you as a stressor. But as you we walk down, you'll kind of see that they gravitate towards us because they don't see us as stress. So it's kind of a low stress, you know, improved quality of life system. Tell me about this mama pig here. Oh my goodness, look at her. Yeah, so she actually just weaned her uh, her first litter. Um, as you walk down, you'll we'll be able to see some of her her babies that just got weaned from her uh, on Monday. Well, she looks pretty happy. Yeah, yeah, and I think <laughs> I think what makes this system unique is it's um it's a deep litter system. Uh, basically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to mimic nature. So we've created a living floor. Um, each one of these stalls go down six feet, and we layer logs, branches wood chips that's to kind of preserve um you know a aerobic environment for the microbes to thrive yeah. and then what we also do is we inoculate it with imos indigenous microorganisms that we brew and then also lactic acid bacteria and that helps break down the ammonia and the pathogens and kind of turn each one of these stalls into a composting pen 
Low smell. Um, if there's no smell, there's less flies. Okay. And then also they, there's, you know, there's a fair amount of space for these pigs to kind of move around. Uh huh. Yeah, they have a lot of room. themselves. <laughs> yes. There's the smaller ones here. Yeah, but as you go to the front, you'll see some pretty young ones. Oh, yeah. cool. Wow. And look at this one's humongous. Yeah. So these guys, the, so over here we have um, the the breeders. So we have mm -hmm. two boars and eight sows. Okay. And every month we try and have a litter. Um, so it is raised for meat production. Uh huh. So every month we send around 12 pigs to slaughter. Um, yeah, and that's to supply our local community with pork and then also some restaurants. That's great. At any given time, we have between 75 to 100 pigs. Wow. Yeah. It's quite an operation. This is actually the mom's um, litter. Oh, they just weaned? Yes, okay. so they just weaned. All right. They do have a lot of space to roam. They do, and then as they kind of get bigger, we'll separate them out. But what we've started to actually incorporate is once they get to about 150 pounds, then we'll move them out to the pasture, and that's where they'll live the rest of their lives. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, this capacity does have like a stocking limit. Uh huh. And we've kind of found that, you know, around 150 pounds, they start making a lot more mess, and it's more labor on our end. Uh huh. So we just pick them out to pasture, and then they can. And then how, like what, um, how much do they weigh before you harvest them for meat production? Uh, we aim for between 275 and 300 pounds. Oh, that's massive. Here we have the little baby piglets. Yeah, these are two weeks old, actually. Oh, these are adorable. Two weeks old? Yeah. They're bigger than I thought they would be for two weeks old. Wow. Yes. So they are still feeding off their mama, I mm -hmm. see. So um, we will let them kind of be with mom for a little longer than most, I think, operations would. So we don't wean them until five weeks. Yeah, so funny thing is I actually saw a couple of your videos when I was actually first learning how to farm. Oh, that is so cool. Yeah. That's <laughs> awesome. It's always amazing to meet our viewers. And well, it looks like you turned the tips you might have learned from me into a huge operation here. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty fortunate. But um, yeah, raised I beds and everything. show you some of these raised beds that we're growing. Um, what we've done here is uh, we've kind of used this agribon as a way to control our crops from the elements. Uh, this area experiences a lot of high wind and high salt, so we needed a way to protect the leafy greens from from those environmental stressors. Wow, so you've got this fabric covers yeah, so over, this... The, over the raised beds here, and I actually have to show how to, do, how to do row covers in my book on raised bed gardening. And look at those greens, oh my gosh, those are beautiful. Those yeah. are beautiful. It's, it's, it's amazing like it's what, this, what this stuff does. Wow. All the colors, I don't see any uh, insect damage or anything like that. I mean, it's working really well. And so these greens are harvested and then taken to the, the market? To, the our, people? to our market, okay. yeah. So um, I don't know if anyone mentioned to you guys, but we do have an on-site market. Yes, we're going to be visiting there as well. But Beautiful. everything we harvest gets washed, packed by us, and then sent directly to the market. And the consumers have the chance to buy it, you know, just hours old. Fresh. Yeah tasty, nothing like buying local and eating local, yes, right? Yes, yes. Those sure. are beautiful and the raised beds look great. I love the design and the construction. Looks very simple. It's very simple. And very it's cost effective. Just PVC bent over these two by sixes and then everything is kind of modular. So if you want to make these longer, we can just put more of these blocks in and put more two by sixes in. I think you need to make a YouTube video for our channel. Yeah, come back. <laughs> All right, we'll do it. <laughs> so this is a type of romaine that we're starting to use. Um, it's not heading as much as we wanted it to. I think maybe the spacing is a little too spread out so it doesn't have to grow up. Oh, okay, I see. But it's beautiful. I mean, these are some of the most beautiful greens I've ever seen. Yeah, Looks this, pretty cozy in there too. It is, it is, it is. <laughs> what are some of the challenges that you've dealt with in growing here and raising the animals and that type of thing? So I think what makes growing in Hawaii particularly difficult is the pest pressure. Okay. Um, in most other states you have a winter that can knock back the pest populations mm -hmm. and also the funguses and pathogens. But in Hawaii the weather is perfect for you know not only the plants to grow throughout the year but also the bugs and the pathogens and all that type of thing. So you just kind of have to be mindful of that when you're growing and just making sure that your IPM is 
is, you know, on par. Okay, <laughs> and just balancing all that out. Yes. But exactly. obviously what you're doing is working really well, and I love how you're able to provide a great resource to the community yeah. from the market here that you have at the ranch. Yeah. It's awesome. I'm stoked. We, this is only something we've started maybe doing this past year. So we haven't seen winter yet. We'll see okay. how this holds up when it's, you know, gusting. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Now, another question for you is what would you say the most fulfilling or satisfying part of your job is? Um, I think it's meeting the consumer, um, letting people know where their food comes from and then creating, letting them create a conversation about the food system. Uh, I think something that resonated with me back when I was farming on my own was when people would, you know, eat these eggs that I sold to them and then they start enjoying breakfast as a family and then talking about like, oh, like this came from a, you know, a brown chicken that had a blue egg and all this kind of <laughs> stuff, you know, just gets people kind of grounded back to the food system. Absolutely. Kind yeah. of back to our roots, literally yes, in the ground, yes, right? Yes. Now, if there's, because we have a lot of viewers that are backyard gardeners, that's what we do. If mm -hmm. you had maybe one thing you could say to someone who's not growing on this big of a scale, but just growing in their own backyard, creating their own, you know, little market, garden yeah, grocery store, like we um, like to call it, what would it be? Maybe not any tips particularly about growing, but maybe more of just getting started is don't get stuck in that, that mindset of analysis paralysis. Um, I feel like a lot of people, even including myself, I'll try and think about things and it'll kind of lead me to like a dead end. Mm -hmm. But if I just started it from the beginning and went through the iterations, I could have gotten to the result that I ultimately was striving to reach. Yeah. That's perfect. That's what I always love to say is just get started mm -hmm. and start simple, expand later, but just get in there, learn it, experiment. You're going to make mistakes, but that's part of the learning process. Yeah, that's the fun part. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're still here in the Ka'a of the Valley, and you might notice some of these spots here from iconic movies or might recognize them. This is an absolutely stunning backdrop. And this is Amy. She handles a lot of the livestock here in this area. What an amazing place you have to work, Amy. Thank you. I know. Um, it's beautiful every day. I get to work with the cows and the fencing. Tell us more about the livestock here and what you do, what your job is specifically. We have two cow-calf herds. This is our Ka'a of a herd. So this is where it all starts. Our, our program starts here with them. Um, they raise their calves. Then when they're done raising them, we raise them for our beef program. Wonderful. So you're in charge of like taking care of the calves, the cows and the calves? Mm -hmm. Basically make sure their needs are met. Okay, cool. Um, that can go as far as making sure they have feed, their water, making sure they're staying in the right spot so we can con roll their feed you know kind of make sure we're taking care of the the ground the grass wonderful um, and grazing it appropriately okay so. and all the beef here is like 100 percent grass fed mm -hmm. if you're taking care of their needs and they're happy does the stress level play into that at all or non-stress level say my stress or their stress <laughs> either one <laughs> no um it can sometimes be stressful for me i'm sure um we definitely try to make sure they're comfortable like um i mean they're they're laying there with us yeah, here, they look chill. we could get closer. Yeah, so a lot of interaction. And here, especially, they have a lot to handle. The tour buses and the quads and the UTVs coming by. But um, because they're so used to it, they're so exposed that their stress levels stay low. You know? Wonderful. And then we try to handle them appropriately as well. And their beef is going to be super tasty, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's the cool thing about Kulo Ranch is that it is a working ranch. That's what it's all about. Very inspiring. So we're here and there and everywhere, all over this place. Wonderful. Yeah. We are here at the vegetable growing operation here at the ranch. Super excited to be here. A lot of our viewers love growing their own food, own vegetables, and you've got quite an operation here. Mm -hmm. So if you could please just go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you grow, how it's grown, and how things are run here, that'd be great. So I'm the manager of this section, the Pahawona Mala section, the aquaculture section, which I believe you guys saw earlier, yes. um, as well as the Lo'i. Um, and I'm here just to help a little bit with precision ag and, uh, you know, taking soil testing and apply it to all the sections here. I'm Erica and I am the organic farmer here. Hi, I'm Brett. I'm with, I'm the partner over here at the Mala with Erica. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So you're growing an organic farm, organic vegetables. What types of crops are you growing? Uh, we have a wide variety of crops like roots, leafy greens, we do fruits as well. Uh, some of our roots are carrots, radishes, and then we do green onions. 
um, kale, salad mixes, all that kind of stuff. How big is the, the gardens here? Um, we're about two acres, I yeah, would say, of growing up. space. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. So a little bit bigger than some of our backyard gardeners mm -hmm. are used to, but absolutely beautiful. And are you growing things like in the different seasons? Like right now, it's winter time for a lot of people. They're mm -hmm. not able to grow. How right. does it work here in Hawaii? shorter photo period so we're trying to focus on more uh, roots to uh, leafy greens and yeah th things like bok choy lettuces carrots things that can handle the more of the rain and less photo period but there still is fallow periods i mean we still let uh, essentially some of the soil rest when mm -hmm. we're not growing in it um, yeah. that's kind of essential for just essentially letting weeds die out and things along those lines we cover everything and so you were talking a little bit earlier about some of the nutrient needs of the soil yeah. like to I, mean, I imagine to produce what you do you've got to really pay attention to that like how do you manage that here yeah so uh, a huge part of that is through soil testing on the mainland you probably could access a soil testing facility like logan labs mm -hmm. um, they're a great place to send a soil sample off to um, you know, you could do six inches, 12 inches, it depends if you're growing in a, a raised bed or if you're actually growing in soil. Um, and then you can get that soil test back and make some decisions on, uh, based on what you're growing and also, uh, you know, the EC of your soil or like the electroconductivity. I don't want to dive wow. too deep into it, but, uh, <laughs> that is definitely part of it. So that can be like a great starting place to, to figure out where you uh, need to like make changes in your fertilization plan. Okay. Yeah. So even as a backyard gardener, we could do that. We could send our soil off and then make adjustments as needed. Yeah, definitely. Because a lot of times people get frustrated it's not growing and they're not sure why. So that, could that possibly be something that Sure, that, that could definitely do? be part of it. Um, you know, a lot of the time, some nutrients are just not available due to something as small as pH changes. Okay. Um, we have soils that are very acidic uh, just due to the parent material, uh, you know, being lava. What are some of the challenges to, to growing in a tropical environment or just challenges in general that you face here at the farm? I think we're just always go, go, go all the time. You know, nothing yeah. slows down for us. Um, that's probably our main challenge. Year round? Yeah. Okay. Heat, a lot more bugs coming around, more more of them yeah 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 how, how do you irrigate uh, operation like this is it mainly through rain or do you have drip irrigation systems uh, we do drip irrigation and overhead irrigation as well um, we use irrigation timers um, okay just to alleviate our, our workload yeah. um, but during the winter we do have a rainy season okay so we that's use nice less, less water we're standing in one of our plots here uh, we got our radishes daikon green onions beets going on and came here to show you guys some purple daikon. Oh, I'd love to see them. <laughs> Beautiful. Look at that so we color. Have, for example, you see one popping out here. Oh, it's beautiful. It can get bigger. We actually have ones that maybe grow out like a, at least an inch or two oh, more. Oh, that's gorgeous. But yeah, if you guys want, you Absolutely need to gorgeous. check this out. Oh, yeah. Look at that color. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> You know, we had a salad last night at a restaurant in uh, yes. Diamond Head. I think it had one of those on it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Maybe it you guys are going to take it home and gorgeous. make another. It okay. was gorgeous. Yeah, it's okay. really pretty. Yeah, wow. this is one of our favorites, especially in Hawaii. Everyone's really big on the, all the Asian foods. Yes. This is where it goes. Yeah. That's awesome. And just like how we talked about in the little picture there, always keep the soil covered. So we're yeah. not going to use that. That's mulch for now. Yeah, great. We got some red table radishes. Nice looking radishes around. there. Mm -hmm. And you get, you're planting them like really densely too. It's pretty dense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's great. You get fit more in here. Yes. Uh huh. We've experimented and we've been pushing out a little further, but this is what we're trying to do with this thought is as the leaves grow up to its maturity, that it's totally covering every area. So therefore, no weeds, better uh, water retention. Yeah, yeah, it makes better use of your time, helps the vegetables grow better, Less weeding. covers the soil. Covers the soil, exactly. My, Can't beat uh, it. Helping the microbial life, exactly. There you go, it's beautiful. It's nice <laughs> yes. looking beets over here too. Yep, you got the red ace beets. Red ace, we got nice. the chayoga. Oh, I love um, those right too. There. Yeah. So you're taking all of this, whatever's harvested, and then it goes to the market, local restaurants? Both, yeah. Okay. Local restaurants, market. We also have, we just came over, a place called Kukua Valley in Kalihi, and they specialize in giving out to, like, CSA boxes to the elderly. Oh, great. Wow. Okay. And 
yeah, they are the forefront in that. So we do a big partnership with them. They have their little cafe and they help. help How nice. There. Yeah, giving out free food sometimes. Nah. If you had maybe one thing to offer people or one suggestion that they could put into practice in their backyard gardens, is there anything that you could offer? Mulch. Always I love it, mulch. Always, always keep it covered. Never have the soil relief show in too much. If you want, if you have a good mulch, you'll have a good microbial life with the, you know, the right temperatures for it, the right environment, and then that mulch is breaking down into good soil. Compost for you guys. Yeah. Love it. How about you, Nick? Uh, me, personally, I, I just think a soil test. Um, I, I'm, yeah. I'm a big proponent of it. I think that soil testing is great. Um, I utilize them even when I'm doing small stuff, uh, just so that I know, like, at least once a year. Keep doing what you're doing. I mean, growing your own food is so powerful, I think. And yeah, that's awesome that you guys are growing in your own backyards. Think about the ecology of maybe your own backyard and try to incorporate that into your gardening, like whether that be the climate or like composting, you know, completing that cycle in your own backyard, I think is really awesome. Wonderful. Those are great suggestions. And I know suggestions that our viewers can really put into practice in their own yards. Thank you so yeah. much for having us. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for visiting. <laughs> Have a good day. <laughs> <laughs> we are here at Kualoa Grown Market, and this is where everything we've seen today really comes full circle. Supplying food to the community. And we're going to head in to meet Tiara, who runs the market here, and hear a little bit more about it. Come on in. Hey, Kim. Hi, Tiara. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thanks for having us to the market. I can't wait to look around. Yeah. Yeah. Would you show us around and let us know a little bit more about what you do here? Yeah, absolutely. So this is our cool little grown farmer's market and uh, everything that you've seen grown on the ranch ends up here at the market um, and gets sold to our local customer base and our visitors that come to check out the ranch. Great. So if you look over here, uh, we have some uwala, some sweet potato. Uh, our sweet potato is mostly grown in Ka'ava Valley that you guys went yes, to. Yes, we did. It was beautiful. Got some dried bananas. Ooh. This is our veggie fridge over here. Oh, so wow. We have quite a mix of uh, fresh vegetables. And we Our got to see some of these at the over in the fields too, so that's really neat to see them here in the market going out to the community. Yeah, so our, our main restock happens um, on Thursday every week, but we like to have stuff in our fridges all week in case locals are coming by on their way home or whatnot. Um, but yeah, we're open seven days a week. Uh, the market really was born out of COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, when the grocery stores had shut down, mm -hmm. we started a farm to car um, kind of offering for I the local that. consumer mm -hmm. base. And it was so popular that it turned into a farmer's market and that has then just grown since. Our uh, locals are, are super loyal. They come every week. <laughs> That's great. And I noticed your prices are really, really amazing. Prices for organic vegetables. Some um, things that keep our prices low. Uh, number one is we don't really work with any distributors. Most of what you see here is all grown on the ranch as far as fresh produce. Um, so not having to pay um, a portion of what you would make on your crop to a distributor helps keep our costs lower. And then also because our business model is diversified, uh, we're really able to prioritize keeping our food affordable. And we have all different types of partnerships here. So we have uh, like our partners from Maui Nui Venison. This is wild harvested medicine from the island of Maui. Oh, wow. Um, so we have partners who we simply just resell their product um, in the market. And then we have co-produced products like our sausages. So we work with a sausage maker on island. Um, we give them our pork that we've grown and raised mm -hmm. here. They then process it, turn it into sausage, give it back to us, and we, re we resell it. So our beef at the moment is mostly restocked on Fridays. Mm -hmm. Again, it's grass-fed, grass-finished. Um, so over here, we have um, our one-pound whole shrimp, which oh, is frozen. These are about the size that I pulled out this morning. 
Oh, and cool. It comes full circle here. Yeah, and then we have our Easy Peels. Bone broths are one of my favorite products that we sell here. So this is another one of our co-produced products mm -hmm. with Forage Hawaii. So we, uh, what she does is she takes our um, beef knuckle bones and then um, turns it into bone broth for us. These um, products right here are new. They're uh, from one of our awesome partners, the Hawaii Ulu Cooperative. Mm -hmm. So their mission is to make um, ulu and other Hawaii-grown uh, staple starches more accessible and more like palatable for the mm. community. Oh, this looks amazing on a hot day. Yeah, this is our juices. Uh, juices. And you know, some of our cool low grown produce was actually used in some of these juices too. Wonderful. So, and there's a lot of partners actually around here uh, that live right around this local area. So it's, it's really cool to be able to develop a personal relationship with them and to be able Wonderful. to support the growth of their small business by being able to provide an outlet and a source for like, steady cash flow. So as far as our um, fresh fruit on the produce stand, it's really dependent on what's in season. Mm -hmm. um, we don't import anything, so mm -hmm. it all comes from us or some of our partner farms around the islands. We send out a newsletter every week on Thursdays, and that's kind of our main form of communication mm -hmm. with our local customer base. We have over 3,000 newsletter subscribers. Wow, that's so great. We like and if anyone wanted to be on the newsletter list, how would they do that? Yeah, so you can go uh, to the link in our bio on our Instagram, and there's a button on there that says subscribe to our cool low ground newsletters. I can tell you're really passionate about what you do here and really love your job. What would you find the most satisfying about running the market here? Um, supporting sustainable agriculture, um, supporting local food producers in Hawaii, and just really improving food security here. I just really love also just being creative and having fun with it. Well, I can tell that you love it because it's a beautiful market. People are coming in, buying produce, enjoying it, being healthier, and it's, it's helping the community out as well. So thank you so much for having us. I really enjoyed you showing us around. Yeah, thank you for stopping by. Taylor, what an amazing day we had here. I can't thank you and your team enough. It was an incredible adventure. I am so glad you guys had a chance to come out. It's so nice when we get to kind of share the, what we do with others, and I'm just glad that it was you guys and, and we had the opportunity. Awesome. I just love seeing how you take care of the land and then the land takes care of you oh, and the community. You. Yeah, thank you. I, I have a terrific team and I, I feel just so fortunate to have this as my job, if you can oh. imagine. We were so blessed. Yeah. Now, what would you like to say to our viewers? Anything in particular as we close out the day here? Just, you know, we have we have something for everybody. I think the kids love it here. You know, adults love to visit. We have everything from ways to enjoy the land as well as places to eat and things to do. And so I think it's just, if you want to get a real taste of Hawaii and, and, and what we do, we'd love to have you out here. Well, I hope you enjoyed our tour today of Kualoa Ranch and Kualoa Grown. We thoroughly enjoyed it, and I highly recommend if you visit the island of Oahu, you definitely make the ranch a part of your stop. Thanks again for having us, Taylor. Thank you so much for coming. I really enjoyed it. Our pleasure. And we'll see you on the next video. Aloha.